Um, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay. yep. All right, excellent. Um, so, hey guys, welcome to um, uh, this, this presentation. Um, yeah, as, as Luke said, if if you guys have any questions as the presentation goes, feel free to uh, drop it in the, in the chat box. I'll try to answer um, as many questions as I can. Um, I guess I'll try, try, I'll try to make it as interactive as possible. So if, you know, if you're curious or you have any questions as, as, as I'm speaking, just yeah, feel free to, to ask in chat, but also, yeah, at the end as well. Um, so I guess just to just give, give an introduction of myself. So my name is Harry and I'm a senior recruitment consultant with SKL. Um, so my role is um, to help like analysts, senior analysts and qualified actuaries with the next career step. So I work across life insurance, general insurance, health, ins uh, health insurance. Um, I work on reinsurance and with um, consultancies as well. Um, I guess just to um, give a brief introduction about SKL as, as well. Um, so we're a um, recruitment consulting firm. Um, so we specialize in recruiting for actuaries and we recruit on all levels. So anywhere from analyst to chief actuary positions. Um, so I guess just to clarify as, as well, um, I, I think a lot of uni, uni students or a lot of um, younger, um, you know, um, more junior candidates aren't really familiar with what a recruitment consultant C does. So I thought I'd just clarify with you guys. So um, we, our role is um, to help help actuaries um, find the next career step. And on the other hand, we, we help our clients, which include like insurance companies, consultancies, and reinsurers help, help find candidates. So we help connect the two, if that sort of makes sense. Um, and our focus is um, in the Asia Pacific region. So mainly, mainly we work in Australia, but also we have recently opened up a um, office in Singapore, which focuses more on the Asia region as well. Um, so just to give a brief introduction to me, to some of my colleagues as well. So Jazz, um, he's the founding director of, of SKL. Um, so he's actually a fellow, he's qualified actually himself. So he's, he's a fellow and has a lot of experience in the insurance industry. Um, I also work with like John, Elisa and Cynthia um, as well. So John has you know, a wide range of experience, same with Elisa and Cynthia is, is also an actuary as well. And she's heading up our Singapore office. Um, yeah, I guess, yeah, I also wanted to touch on how exactly does SKL assist graduates? Um, so just, yeah, I guess something important to note, yeah, we're a specialist recruitment agency, so we don't hire actuaries ourselves, but we source, um, actuaries for Australian financial industry. So yeah, like, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, like insurance companies, reinsurers, consultancies, um, like to be honest, I would say a lot of times we don't really help we aren't really able to help graduates too much just because our clients don't really need help recruiting for, for graduates. Like, you know, as you guys probably know, you know, there's a lot of graduate programs out there, like Big Four, for example, have have all their own, own graduate programs. Um, and most, a lot of companies do it themselves. So, which is why they don't really need that help. So our, we mainly, you know, help um, actuaries that have, you know, a bit more experience, maybe not at the graduate level, but um, there's, from time to time, we do get graduate roles and, you know, we can help assist in terms of, you know, other things such as like, yeah, CV applications, like, you know, if you want feedback on CV, feel free to reach out or, um, you know, you want, you just want to know about the market or just, you know, just curious about, you know, um, seeking advice for, for looking for a graduate job as well, you know, happy, happy to help out as well. And we do have um, up-to-date information such as uh, you know, on actual news and also, you know, we do things such as like salary survey, which um, gives benchmarks of, you know, what's the average salary is for an actuary throughout their career as well. Um, so, I mean, I thought I'd just say kick off, you know, I, I don't think you guys, um, you know, it's not, not too important because you, know, you guys all will be actuaries, but, um, um, actuaries, I guess, mainly work in insurance, reinsurance, and um, as consultants um, as well. Um, maybe reinsurance is probably not as well known um, as it's you know a small industry, but you know there's definitely a lot of actuaries there, and definitely a good good industry to be in as well. Um, so I guess you know um, actuaries, they also work in you know insurance. I'd say that's the main main place to work in but you know it could also be superannuation could be wealth management could be investments 
um, anything, to be honest, anything like financial um, services related, um, you know, banking, um, financing, um, you know, even data analytics, that's quite a big trend in terms of actuaries, you know, even people leaving, you know, traditional actual roles, a lot of them are going toward data analytics as well. That's, you know, pretty up, up and coming thing. And I guess um, it's, it's, it's a stance that also the actuaries Institute has moved towards as well. Um, so I thought I'd just, you know, share, um, share some insight into potential career um, or in industries that actuaries can work in. So this is taken directly from the Actuaries Institute, but um, the majority of, of actuaries would work in um, general insurance and life insurance. Um, so this is primary practice area, but um, it can, I believe it from the stats, it can sort of overlap as well. So, so for example, you can do general insurance and data analytics, or, you know, some roles can offer general insurance and health insurance. Um, but also keep in mind that these are all, I believe these are um, statistics of qualified actuaries. So, so fellows only. Um, so it doesn't include like analysts, senior analysts um, that that haven't qualified yet. Um, and I thought, yeah, just give you a um, an overview of some of the roles as well. So, for example, you know, um, these are the most two common roles in in a direct insurer, like a pricing role versus valuation. Um, so throughout, I guess, throughout your career as an actuary, actuaries have, you know, they might, you know, experience both. Like, for example, like some companies might have graduate rotation programs where they do rotations between pricing and valuation. Um, but, um, pr pricing and valuation, I'd say it's, it's, it's good, it's good, um, it's good to have both because it gives you a better picture of how the insurance um, how like the whole insurance industry works, right? Pricing is just one part of of the whole insurance industry, which is you know very complicated. So the more exposure you have um, to different parts of of the insurance business, the better um, I guess employee, a better candidate you are as well. Um, it'll give you more in depth uh, technical understanding, um, and you know it'll probably also help you in terms of interviews as well. Um, so what exactly is valuation? Um, so valuation is responsible for determining the reserves of an insurance company. Um, do you guys notice already? So I'll probably just skip through this. Um, and you know, pricing is responsible for determining the premiums that are charged. Um, but what exactly, I guess, what are, exactly are the differences between, you know, uh, a profession in actual pricing versus, um, valuation, you know, role in pricing versus in the valuation team. So, um, so I guess the difference is the type of calculations they do. So pricing actually calculates premiums, whereas valuation actually calculates reserves. Um, so therefore, you know, pricing actually is actually dealing with the future business that hasn't necessarily been acquired yet, but um, valuation actually is dealing, deals with um, policyholders that are currently there already. Um, and also, um, Sorry, this chat bar, I'm just gonna close the chat bar. Um, yeah, pricing actually, I'd say the work is a bit more project-based. Um, so for example, if a company is offering a new insurance product, the pricing team will be responsible in terms of, you know, determining whether this is, you know, valid product, um, you know, maybe some of the assumptions that, um, maybe set some assumptions that are fine premiums well and um, valuation actuaries the, the work I'd say is tends to be more routine more you know kind of laid out for you for example like um, they do you know like monthly month end reporting you know it's more um, financial reporting which is uh, you know a bit le less project based and you know it's a bit more structured um, as well um, and how exactly can actuaries progress with um with their careers so you know even after graduating actuaries need to study in order to qualify so you know you probably get some exemptions through your university degrees um but you know most most actuaries also um study full-time sorry study um while while working full-time as well and you know some of these exams especially you know part threes um have you know very low pass rates like some some 30 40 percent um you know, some might even be 15 to 20 percent um as well um so these definitely you know very challenging exams and um you know i would i would definitely recommend you know to take to take these exams if you know you're serious about 
you know, um, continuing as an actuary. Um, you know, it will help you in terms of, you know, career progression. So not only in terms of salary, but um, also, you know, if you want to fast track your career, um, it's good to, you know, co constantly be studying through exams and try your best to pass. You know, um, yeah, generally, you know, the more exams you pass, you know, the higher salary is as well. And some companies might give you a pay rise upon qualify sorry upon passing and generally you know you, you can receive a um, pretty big pay rise when you qualify as, as a fellow as well um and generally i'd say actuaries tend to move around um you know every two to three years to different companies i'd say honestly i'd say um actuaries probably tend to move move around a bit more compared to other professions um where you know two or three years might be pretty quick but um I guess in terms of um, actuaries, there's there's just a lot of um, you know different type of roles that that you can get exposed to, right? So for example, you know pricing, like what I mentioned before, like pricing pricing role is very different to evaluation role, right? Um, you know you can do that within like for example a direct insurer, you can do that um, you know in consulting, right? You know there's pretty big differences in working in a direct insurer versus you know working in a reinsurer versus working in a consultancy as well. So um you know it's it's quite good to get different exposure especially before you qualify as well um uh, where you know when, once as a qualified actually there is more i guess more expectation um be, upon being able to do things independently for example as well um so i guess the traditional um uh, career progression as an actuary um you know follows follow this sort of sort of route so for example for example like for an insurance company it might be you know you generally start as an actual analyst or you know pricing analyst or whatever um and then you know you progress to become a senior actual analyst um and then you might become an actuary manager senior actuary senior manager um and then for consultancies i mean it's quite it's different depending on which consultancy like for example affinity has different titles compared to like KPMG, but generally, you know, start off as a consultant, you have a senior consultant, manager, director, partner, there might, you know, be a few in between as well. Um, but that's generally the, the career progression is generally quite set out as well. Um, I thought I'd also give a, a brief overview of perhaps, you know, what's the differences between, you know, consultancies, also, you know, break, brief breakdown of, of, you know, general insurance, uh, life insurance, and just, I guess, give you a brief overview of, you know, potential opportunities as, as a graduate uh, and where you can sort of start your career in. But um, in terms of consulting, I guess, which is quite a popular um, option um, or qu quite a popular um, role to, to graduates, um, me, I thought I'd just make it a bit more interactive, but um, does anyone know any actual consultancies? Maybe list, maybe name some companies. Does anyone want to volunteer? On the big four? Yep, big four. Um, so yeah, EY, KPMG, Deloitte, PwC, they're all consultancies. Um, anyone else? What's another consultancy besides the big four? Feel free to type it in chat as well if you're not comfortable saying it. AIA, um, I would actually say AIA, unfortunately, it's not a consultancy. Um, they're a direct insurer. So AIA, AIA is a life insurance company. So um, they're not exactly a consultancy. Does anyone want to maybe try give a definition of what a, what a consultancy is? Okay, all good, all good. Um, so a consultancy, um, I, I guess to explain the, the biggest difference between consultancy and, and the direct insurer as well. So a consultancy actually they um they don't sell their own products. Um, so consultancies they more so provide um you know their services. So for example, like you know like a life insurer, right? So AIA, for example, they sell life insurance products or TAL, they have their life insurance products, right? But whereas KPMG, they they don't sell any products. Um, so they sell the services. So essentially, for example, if AIA wants to release a new product to the market, they might seek out KPMG's advice um, in terms of, you know, is, is this actual product, 
is this a good product? You know, what are some some maybe some factors to consider when when you know, when um, releasing this product to market as well? So consultancies give advice, um, you know, recommend strategies, but they don't necessarily sell any products th themselves. Does that sort of make sense? Okay, excellent. Um, so yeah, for example, yeah, often clients will um, yeah, go to a consultancy when they're yeah, long-term financial arrangements. Um, so they can advise in terms of like your yeah, business modeling, maybe valuations, product pricing, um, risk analysis, stuff like that as well. Um, so I think, yeah, I think I touched on this um, a bit already, but um, um, yeah, just to reemphasize. So you know, yeah, insurance companies, they offer, you know, insurance coverage to the public. So for example, yeah, like Allianz, maybe they offer, you know, um, they offer CDP insurance or they offer home and contents insurance um, as well. So working in in a um, direct insurer um, gives you an interest, I guess, to, to dive specific specifically into an area as well. Um, so for example, you might just be focused on a pricing role. You know, you might only be interested in pricing. Um, and um, that would be a very good place um, to, so, sorry, working in a direct insurer would give you that sort of exposure if you have a pricing team. Whereas if you compare it to consulting, which is a bit more project-based, um, so, you know, they would be doing like, they could be doing valuation, they could be doing, you know, um, pricing, they could be doing anything and just, depends on the sort of work they that they win um and sort of what's what's available at the time so for example like you know kpmg or ey they might they have a, you know quite a large number of employees um so they might have you know a few hundred consultants they would generally shift around um the workload depending on you know what sort of projects they have going on as well um and another difference i guess between them um, is, yeah, like I mentioned before, that they work, um, consultancies work alongside these these insurers. Um, so, um, for example, yeah, like what I mentioned before, like if AIA goes to goes to KPMG for, for assistance, like AIA is actually KPMG's client. Um, so they work, you know, they work alongside each other as well. So um, the benefits of working consultancy is that you know, you do have a wide range of exposure to the market, right? You might be working with, you know, different insurers, right? You might be working with AI, you might be working with TAL, you know, it might be working with MLC. Um, so working with different different clients, you know, trying out different roles can give you quite a quite broad exposure as well. Um, <clears throat> a career consult consultancy can also, um, give you a lot of, uh, okay, can help you build a lot of soft skills as well, such as presenting um, and building relationships with clients. This is a big part of, um, you know, um, of a career in, in consulting, consulting um, you know, and that's why generally consultants have, you know, very, very strong communication skills. And also, you know, consulting firms do offer very good training and support in terms of, you know, um, building up your communication skills um, to be able to speak to clients, you know, speaking to clients might be, you know, quite a scary thing, especially, you know, as, as a young graduate, um, but, you know, throughout your role, you you build up your experience and eventually be comfortable to point um, or confident to the point where you can easily speak to a client as well. And, you know, public speaking, you know, presenting clients is definitely an excellent skill to have. Um, and, you know, definitely something you'll pick up at a consultancy as well where if you compare it to a direct insurer, there's, you know, you're not really presenting to clients, you're more in-house. Um, so you might be presenting to other members of your team, but it wouldn't really be to external parties. Um, so I guess, you know, there's not as much of an opportunity to, to build up your public speaking skills or client relationship skills as well. Um, and interesting enough, I guess there is a general impression among graduates that consultancies um, demand longer working hours, uh, making it difficult to pass actual exams. Um, and it seems like, you know, people, um, you know, it seems like graduates actually, you know, really enjoy 
or I guess the popular opinion is to go work in a consultancy. Like, you know, like a lot of the graduates that I speak to at uh, like uh, networking events, or like events such as these, they, they, they really want to get in big four, for example, um, which, which is quite interesting. Um, so, I mean, I would say, to be honest, in terms of like the first dot point here, um, that consultancies demand longer working hours. I mean, I would say on average, to be honest, that's probably true. Um, because it's a client-facing role, you know, you have deadlines from clients. If if a client's asking you to finish work, you know, um, you know, give you they give you a deadline to tell you to finish work, you know, you can't tell them, oh, you know, we'll push it back later. You know, actually you just gonna finish on time. So that's why, you know, in terms of when deadlines are tight, you know, my the work-life balance probably isn't as good compared to compared to a corporate. Um, but in terms of um passing actual exams, there's a huge emphasis by consultancies on passing your actual exams, I'd say compared to insurer, uh, direct insurers. Um, so um, for example, being a fellow at a consultancy versus not being a fellow, there's pretty big difference. Like being a fellow is much more presentable toward to a client than when you're not qualified um, as well. So um, and generally, the more qualified you are, like, you know, the higher your title is, the more you charge or the more you bill as well. Um, so consultancies have a huge emphasis on helping their consultants pass their exams. So there might be study groups, um, you know, where, um, you, you know, you have a cohort of peers that are signing for exam exam, you know, you can study together, you know, there might be, you know, someone, you know, more senior that's helping, helping or like someone that has passed exam already that's helping, helping out the group as well. So definitely... Um, I think it helps contribute to um, you know the very high um, exam pass rates that the consultant consulting um, firms do have. So uh, the average cons average um, pass rate for consultancies is actually sixty percent um, versus industry average, which is about thirty to forty percent as well. Um, so yeah, I thought I'd just yeah, make that distinction um, as well. Um, a day in the life of an actual consultant. So this is di taken directly from KPMG, um, KPMG's website. So, you know, a normal day in office, you might usually start with a coffee run in the morning, you know, with a couple, co couple of colleagues, you know, might have a few, few meetings with um, managers and, you know, discuss what sort of ongoing projects you might have. And then you might start doing like actual tasks and, um, you know, relate to client, client matters as well. Um, and generally, um, you know, you, you had a, you would have like a study, study mentor, sorry, um, like a career counselor or like a mentor that would kind of help plan out your career as, as a consultant, you know, um, and help you sh kind of shape what you want to do as well. But, um, you know, you might be doing stuff as, you know, visiting clients, um, you know, um, whether that be in person, uh, or online, I think I'd say most of most client meetings probably are happening online now due to due to COVID. Uh, but um, yeah, it also really depends on what, what sort of workload. So, you know, if you've got a lot of deadlines, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, it can be quite quite hectic. But uh, you know, if you don't have much going on, it can be quite chill as well. So, um, it's really it's really it's I guess quite I guess it's quite varied depending on the workload and sort of what's going on at the time as well. Um. June, I guess just to get also give you um you know more of a picture as well. So junior level actuaries in consulting firms are generally responsible for more of the you know technical data intensive work. Um and uh, I mean the work is you know, you know it's project based, so it's dependent on the needs of the client. Um but generally um consulting firms follow a hierarchy. So generally um you know, the more senior you are within a consultancy firm, the more, um, I guess, managerial responsibilities you have as well. So, you know, even as a senior consultant, for example, at KPMG, you might be expected, if, you know, for example, you, you know, might be one of the more senior members on that project. You, you would be expected to maybe mentor more junior members. So maybe like, you know, consultants, maybe grads, maybe interns, you know, or like you know, people working part-time, for example. Uh, but, you know, it's generally quite structured um, in terms of, you know, um, who to go for advice, you know, who's who's sort of helping out in which area as well. Um, and just, I guess, to recap, maybe some of the points that I've mentioned before as well. So the benefit of working at a consultancy um, is that you do get a wide range of opportunity 
to work across different projects. So, you know, spending your pricing, reserving, you know, um, you know, uh, more reporting, you know, could be audits if you're uh, at the big four, for example, as well. Um, I guess there is a downside to that though, um, compared to if you, if you compared to a role in, in insurance as well. So for example, you know, um, if you're in a pricing role at, at, um, you know, at a direct insurer, you're probably, you know, more, you're probably more specialized in pricing compared to a consultant. So consultant, you know, they're good. They've got very good soft skills. They can pick up things quite quickly, um, but they might not necessarily be as technically strong in one specific area because, you know, compared to someone that's in corporate because they're, they're only specializing in, in, in that area. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's ups and downs um, to, to both, both sides. Uh, but yeah, I guess it's something that's quite important to consider as a grad as, as well in terms of, you know, what's your preference. Um, so, you know, whether it's more, project-based work, um, you know, work with different clients, you know, client, um, versus working more in-house as well. So both, both are good options. Um, I think I touched on this already. Um, and I thought I'd just, yeah, also give you, I guess, um, an overview of, of the market just in terms of, you know, who are the players as well. So in this presentation, I also go, I'll go over, you know, the consultancy firms out there, you know, general insurance companies and also life insurance companies as well. But, um, you know, for example, yeah, like, you know, Deloitte, you know, one of the big four, um, they've recently acquired Rice Warner, uh, but, you know, they, they offer, you know, actual services in terms of, yeah, banking, wealth, management, life insurance, health, general insurance, superannuation, valuation. So, they do a little bit of everything. Um, EY is also a um, you know also part of Big Four, um, and yeah, you know, they all they have consultancy services across like yeah, life insurance, general insurance, health insurance. Um, so you know it's quite quite a broad range of work um, as well. So so have you know KPMG and and PwC are some of the other consulting firms as well. Um, I guess some of the maybe the, the smaller ones, but um, they are quite quite well known in the actual industry. For example, you know, Affinity um, you know, is um, you know, is quite a well well known and um, reputable consultancy as well. That's not part of the big four, um, so they specialize mainly in general and health insurance. Um, so whereas, like for example, KPMG, they have general insurance and life insurance teams. Affinity doesn't offer life insurance, so they specialize mainly in general insurance and health insurance. Um, as, as well. Um, so in terms of yeah, the exp expertise, like you know, they might do like reserving pricing, capital, um, appointment actuary services. They do quite a lot of work in like in terms of data analytics um, as well. And they've been doing quite a lot of interesting projects in, like climate change, for example. Um, and Taylor Fry is, is also um, another consultancy as well. So, you know, pretty, um, I guess similar to to affinity and that they they only specialize in general insurance mainly but they also do uh, like um, data analytics and actual advice to like government that's quite quite a big part of Telefry's work um so they're they are owned by um um they're actually majority owned by Qantas Qantas um so which is quite an interesting fact um as well but in terms of yeah in terms of what they do like you know it's quite similar to some of the other consultancies like upon actual services, um, data analytics as as well. Um, pretty much anything that um was I guess that includes a span of like you know evaluation, pricing, um, you know, modeling as well. Um Rice Warner, so this has now been acquired by um by Deloitte, um, but previously the other day they ran as a separate list. Um, entity that was founded by um, Michael Michael Rice, um, but they're mainly specialized in terms of like superannuation um, consulting. That's and I guess life insurance as well. But that was mainly what they they do did previously. Um, another consultancy is is Willis Towers Watson. Um, as well um so it's a very large large company um so they have a lot of different arms but um you know they do have you know consulting teams like you know they do work on like life insurance uh they do work on like retirements defined benefits 
um you know super as well uh, they've got you know it's a very very big big um company so they've got a lot of different teams there but you know it's not a consultancy as well and um i don't think i listed it here but quantum is is quite a quite another well-known consultancy as well um does anyone have any questions about consulting or maybe perhaps the differences between consulting and insurance companies just one question harry um yeah. Would you be able to expand on the role of what the um, like appointed actuarial service offered by consultancy involves? Yeah, yeah. So, for example, like maybe um, a smaller, smaller company, um, they might not have um, a point actuary. So that's why they would, um, I guess, go to a consultancy for for help, um, just in terms of like you know maybe some of the reporting stuff or like valuation stuff. So that's why a lot of consultancies offer a point actuary services. Um, so I'd say, yeah, a lot of the big companies do it in-house, um, but um, you know, yeah, maybe some of the smaller companies would go to consultancies for upon actuary services. All right, thanks. Yeah, yeah excellent question. Any, any other questions? Um, yeah, so you mentioned um, on average, I guess, Mongo Hour is demanded yeah. by consultancies. Yeah. Um, how does the average salaries compare, I guess, across junior level positions um, between consultancies and insurance firms? Yeah, okay. Um, that's a that's a good question. Um on average, I'd say consultancies probably pay do pay a little bit better um compared to insurance companies. Um uh I'd guess I guess also, you know. Like I mentioned before, there's you know there's general consensus, especially among graduates, you know that consultancy is the best you know, place to start the career. Um, that's why I guess you see a lot of like for example, co-op students go into into consultancies or they start out there. Um, I guess that also does raise the salary because for example, like you know a co-op student already has a few years of experience before before um you know joining um joining like a, a full full time permanent role compared to uh, like you know someone that doesn't but um you know I'd say consulting sees because of you know of the high uh, demand to get in consulting consulting firms they also do have um I guess maybe a bit more um they are a bit more selective as well they have quite quite high standards for example to get in like some consultancies might have like a distinction why I'm cut off as well um but i'd say across across on average you know um yeah, they do probably pay a bit better but also you know can be out of factors as well like you know someone that's got you know a few years or like you know done a few internships would get a higher salary than someone that has never worked or has has doesn't have any actual experience for example is that's something else to consider okay does that sort of make sense yeah, no. Yeah. Sense. Excellent. Any other questions? Feel free to yeah, type it in chat um, as well. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Kang. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Sorry, can, can I can't hear you? Are you saying something? Do you have a question, Trang? Um, if if your mic isn't working, feel free to type it out, and we can just read it for you. Okay. Um. Yeah. Let's break up. Okay, that's a good question. Um, 
Can I just ask, what's your role in um in that insurance broker? Is this an actual role or is this more of a broker role? Um, I think that you can hear me now. Um, actually, I can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. All right, yeah, I'm working at um just a broker role, but um this is um part time role, yeah. and I already have like eight years experience in general insurance, but uh in Vietnam, not in Australia, and yeah. I am interested in looking for a um, position as an actuary. Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah, but not in the consulting uh, firms anyway. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, as in tier, tier one and tier two, are those part one and part two exams? Is that what you mean? Right. Yeah. 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 Um, I guess insurance broke, broker, especially, I mean, if I think you said you're not in, a, in a, an actual role, you're in a broken, broken role. Um, I would say it's... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, my role is um, more, more of a broken, not actual role. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you wanted to continue as a broker, um, I would say it's not really required to continue your actual qualifications. Um, I would say yeah, it might help you um, in terms of understanding the insurance business, but you know, since it's not really an actual role, it's, I would say it's probably not required. Right, uh, but I mean that, because I want to get uh, more experience in Australian market, so I apply for to um broker in a broken company. But um, yeah. my ultimate goal is to get into actuary science. Actually, I am studying in master of uh, actuary science in Monash. Yeah. So okay. so I just wondering if um because I'm I'm not quite sure about the rules in Australia. I don't know if. I want to be an actuary. Do I have to get Title One and Title Two uh, qualification to to be an actuary in Australia? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to. Like, there are people who choose to not continue to actual exams just you know because life, life, um, you know, life gets in the way. But um, yeah, like um, what what Sal Yang he said, um, yeah, like the more exemptions you get, the better. To be honest um as as well um you know the more the more exemptions you have the more qualified as an actuary you are but it's not a hard set prerequisite you know you have to have this this many amount of exams to, to be in to become an actuary all right does that okay, sort of thank you. Sense? yeah yeah okay all good um I think a few other questions popped up um how many exams would you suggest have passed by a graduation course to get job in consulting um yeah similar to to current session so yeah the, honestly the more the more exams the more exemptions you have the better as well um does SKL get opportunities that are open for international students yes yes we do um I guess just keep in mind that you know obviously um yeah, the co companies will ha might have concerns about you know working rights as as well so you know if um if you're on a visa, um, you know, I think outline to them, you know, when exactly your visa expires, how long do you have it for as well. But, um, you know, I would say most graduates do, uh, most graduates, yeah, a lot of graduates, sorry, are on visas, but um, SKL can um, can help. Um, but like, yeah, like, like I mentioned earlier in, in the um, presentation, to be honest, we don't really get too many graduate roles. Um, most of the roles we do get are like, you know, uh, for people that have got a few years experience but yeah from time to time we we do have um analyst level roles as well um so if you are interested you know feel free to maybe connect on linkedin or maybe have a look at the skl website as well but um yeah and what all types of jobs can we do at the start of um actual career um so generally like um you know actuaries can you, know, you can start in the yeah, consulting firms, insurers, reinsurers. You know, um, the, that's you know most of the industries that the actuaries typically work in, as well. I hope, hope that um answers your questions. Um, Labor had a question. Are you referring to undergraduate students or graduates with foundation program when you talk about junior level? Um, so yeah, that'd be the same. Um, 
undergraduates or graduates, like essentially like you know, people that I guess um juniors as in you know don't really have too much working experience. Um, is there a min minimum number of exams to have at least passed? Um, no. Um, the like yeah, the more the better. Is it common for actuaries to finish the part twos and then then not become fellows? Um, I'd say it's it can be quite common, especially if they're not in an actual traditional actual role. Um, like for example, if you're like in data analytics, you know, you might want not, not want to do part threes. Um, you know, it, it can um, you know, or like, you know, for example, you know, you get married or you know, you know, have a kid or something, um, you know, life gets in the way, right? Especially when you're when you're working. So some people choose not to, to continue their part part threes. Um I mean, my, my honest recommendation is, you know, if, if you're going to, especially, you know, got to continue down like a traditional um, actual career path is to finish your part threes. Um, you know, try, try best to qualify. Because, you know, it, if, you, if you don't finish part three, sometimes it can hold you back um, in terms of career, um, career or like salary progression as well. Um, I had a few questions. Hello, other questions and exams. Um, one, one correct or wrong answer. Um, so, so I mean, I've, I've, I've never sat the actual exam myself, but um, you know, it's it's generally like a few different questions, and then you know, it's like a scenario, um, scenario based questions. Yeah, so it might only be like four, or five, or six questions in the in the exam, but you know, you need to demonstrate um, you know, your understanding of that question. Um, so it's not like a you know multiple choice question, but it's more of a scenario based question as well. Um, does why I'm graduate matter for graduate roles? Um, I think yeah, I'd say it can. Um, like for example, like you know some reinsurers or consultancies might have a WAM cut off, um, but generally I'd say WAM's pretty important. I'd say in terms of actual compared to maybe other um, other professions. Um, you know, because if you do if you do have a low WAM, you know, employers might think, oh, you know, if this person's struggling with you know university, how are they gonna qualify as a fellow? Um, so that just might bring out some concerns, you know, um, if you do have quite a quite a low WAM. But you know, I mean this can be counteracting in other ways. Like for example, you've got a lot of experience, you know, you've been working part-time as an intern for, you know, two years, and then your WAM's, you know, 50 something, like, you know, that. Yeah, there, there can be a particular reason why um but you know generally i'd say yeah try try working try working in your WAM. it's also i mean you can get more exemptions if your you know WAM's higher as well or your, your marks higher um i think that's that's all the questions yeah if there's any other questions feel free to pop them in the chat or feel free to unmute your mic but i think yeah i think it seems like we're running a bit low on time so i think we'll just continue the presentation as well um, a few other things just um to cover so yeah life i thought i'd just give you guys a clear picture of you know major industries yeah such as like life insurance um and you know what are the potential companies that you know you can go work for as well so um, I mean, the figure's a bit outdated, so this is from 2020, um, but um, this is the market share of the life insurance companies in, in Australia. So um, I think the figure is still up to date in terms of like the, you know, where where companies are in terms of standings, like Tel, Tel is the biggest company, um, AIA second biggest, Zurich's, Zurich's third. Um, and there's, there's been a few acquisitions that, that have sort of happened recently as well. So, you know, the numbers have sort of changed. Um, so Tal is the biggest company, um, sorry, biggest life insurance company. Um, so, you know, they've been been around for quite a, quite a long time and they're actually owned by a Japanese insurer, Dai, Daiichi Life. Um, does anyone know any, any interesting news about Tal that's happened recently? Just, just curious. That, so recently, yeah, recently made an, a recent acquisition. Does anyone know what which company they've acquired? All good, all good. Um, so they've actually recently acquired BT, um, so Westpac's life business. So, um, pretty interesting um, that that yeah they've acquired BT and. That acquisition is going to be happening next next week. So BT, everyone from BT Life is going going to move across the towel. Um, 
so yeah it's good to read a read up read up on like the you know, industry industry knowledge like for example if you if you're interviewing a tell like you know this is this is something that you know that you might want to bring out with interviewers like you know could could impress them as well you know that, that could be a quite good question to ask at, during an interview like oh i heard that you know uh tell is acquired bt um you know how how's that transition or how is that acquisition maybe going to affect its role or how is that acquisition going to affect the company um, those are yeah, good things to to know about um you know so it's good to yeah keep keep up to date with with market information um so ai they're the second biggest life insurer um sorry yeah i'm not sure yeah sorry i think the the, the notes didn't get updated but um um ai is second largest life insurer and they're actually a hong kong based company uh, as well um zurich is the third Sure. So they are a Swiss Swiss um, company, and they've recently acquired um, One Path. Um, so that was ANZ um, Life Business. So the big four banks have have sold pretty much all of their um, their life insurance businesses. So um, Com Com Insure, so Com Bank's life insurance business has actually been sold to AIA recently as well. Um, so Zurich owns yeah, one path book now. Um, MLC, um, it's um, another big player in the life insurance market. So they're actually 20% owned by NAB, but uh, majority owned by the Pond Life um, Insurance Group, um, which is a Japanese company as well. But um, yeah, previously it was 100% owned by NAB. So, so all the big four banks have essentially sold off their life insurance books now. Um, Resolution Life is another um, player in the life insurance market. So they are previously um, they they bought out AMP's old book. Um, so now you know it's a, it's a, it's a, all all of AMP's old business is under Resolution Life now. But um, AMP still has I guess a stake. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, BT's sold to Tal now. But um, you know they're uh, another player in the market. Um, MedLife is is not a um, life insurance company, um, so they're they're a US based company, but um, they're quite well, I guess, well known for their group business. So they're the third largest group insurer in Australia. Um, Clearview is a bit of a smaller play, I guess most people don't know about, um, but um, yeah, it's 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 another player in the market that's that's been doing quite well for themselves recently. Um, does anyone have any? Questions about life insurance companies or the life insurance market? Feel free to unmute your mic or maybe type questions in the chat. Okay, all good. Um, I'll move on to the general insurance industry as well. So um, as of 2016, there are 109 APRA registered general insurers. Um, so 99 direct insurers and 10 reinsurers. Um, so most of the market is dominated by four four major players. So IEG, Suncorp, QB, and Allianz. Um, so these figures are a bit outdated. So the, back from 2016, so the numbers have sort of shifted around a little bit, but um, IEG, IEG, Suncorp, QB, Allianz, major players, um, common sure was you know um, was also a pretty big player as well they've they've now sold off their business does anyone know who's who um common sure have sold off their business to their digital insurance business hollard yeah yeah um yeah so it's hollard so um so Unfortunately, not AIA. So, Common Insurance Life Insurance business has been sold to AIA. So, you're right on that, Luke. Um, but yeah, the general insurance business has been sold to Hollard, um, um, which is yeah a bit of a up and coming company. So, um, interesting enough, you know, if you look at the market, you know, um, premiums by um, so market share by annual premiums, Hollard, you know, back in 2016 was only one percent, but you know they've acquired you know a company that's you know got a bigger market share than them. And that that transition, I guess, is going to be happening quite soon. So it's going to be happening in um, October. Um, Westpac has also sold off their general insurance business. Does anyone know who Westpac has sold off their insurance business to? Um. 
Um, Hints, it's one of the other companies on this list here. One of the big, uh, one of the bigger for general insurers. Yep, yep, that's right, Allianz. Um, so Allianz has acquired um, Westpac now. And then um, some of these other companies are Brisbane based, like UE, um, ICQ, or in general, they're, you know, they've got a bit of a smaller market. Um, you know, they're all G Brisbane based um, roles, or Bis sorry, Brisbane based companies. Um, and a bit of a maybe a, a more up to date um, picture of the car insurance market. Um, so this is from 2020. So NRMI, NRMA, sorry, is is one of the bigger players. So subsidiary of IG, um, and then SunCorp is is second. QB's third. Allianz is fourth. Um, and got some other players here as well. So just give you a, yeah, an overview of IEG. Um, so you know, some of these companies you know, have a lot of different different subsidiaries. So you know, um, you know, NRMA, you know, is a very well known company, um, like brand brand of IEG. Um, but yeah, they're quite, quite a dominant player um, in the general insurance market. Um, and you know, something interesting, yeah, for example, you know, they have a, actually have a strategic partnership with Berkshire Hathaway, which is um, uh, Warren Buffett's company. Um, so it's quite quite interesting. But yeah, they do, you know they mainly offer you know commercial vehicle home contents insurance as well. Um, yeah, it's some of the products they offer. Yeah, it's quite a quite an extensive list. Um, Suncorp, you know, not a big player in the general insurance market um, as well. Yeah, publicly listed company. Um, you know, so these are some of the products offered. So you know, as you can see, it's a very very wide wide list, and you know, a lot of subsidiaries under on, under these. Um, these massive companies so like Amy, you know, might have, you know might be quite familiar with. Um, you know, Shannon's quite an interesting subsidiary. You know, is mainly focusing on more like you know niche, um, like yeah, motor motor enthusiasts um, as well. Yeah, but like yeah, more like it's more like um collectible cars, etc. Um, racing memorabilia. Um, and they so some corps they used to have a life insurance business. Um. As well, but um, they've they've sold that off now. Does anyone know who who's acquired Suncorp Life's business? Maybe put in the chat or feel free to unmute your mic if you know. So who has bought out Suncorp Life's business? Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. You're right. Tal Tal has bought out Suncorp Life's business. Oh, very very knowledgeable. Um. That's good. That's good to see. Um, Sao, Sao Yang Hu. Sorry, sorry if I mispronounced your name, but yeah, like, um, things have been on fire. But yeah, Tal has recently bought out, um, Suncorp's, um, life book, um, quite a, quite a few years back. Um, QBE is not a, you know, major player in, in terms of general insurance companies. So it's quite, quite, a, quite an old company, but, um, you know, they do offer a lot of, you know, services as well so you know i uh, may uh, maybe some of the more niche ones like farm insurance but um you know home and builders more like niche niche products but um you know it's wide wide very wide coverage by them as well um uh, allianz um you know yeah like you know so they purchased you know um westpac's general, general, general insurance business back in 2021 for you know 725 million dollars um yeah and the common shore um, so it's been sold off now. It's, um, as mentioned before, it's Hollard. Um, and you know, I thought I'd just touch on yeah, some other more you know, small insurers. So UE based based in um, Brisbane as well. So it's owned by an Afri African company. Um, and Hollard um, is is a South African company. Um, that's I'd say they're probably the fastest growing general insurance company. Um, at at the moment. So yeah, like yeah, they recently bought bought Hollard. Sorry, they've recently bought out Common Shore, and you know that they they do offer some you know interesting you know products. Such as they they offer pet insurance as well, um, under one of their subsidiaries. Um, yeah, that's 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 it for today's presentation. But um, does anyone have any questions about you know general insurance or about anything else? Feel free to unmute your mic or maybe type it in the chat.
Um, hey, Harry, thanks for the presentation. Are you able to give some maybe examples of study leave that you've come across offered by different employers at all? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, I mean, SKL also does like a, a study salary survey, which I guess gives gives a um, industry average for study support. Um, but um, I would say generally consultancies probably are the more, the most um, generous in terms of study leave. Like uh, they're, they're very competitive. Um, and I mean, I, I would say the market is probably around anywhere from maybe 10 to 14 days for part three exams. Um, I'm, you know, was there anything specific that you wanted to know about the study support, Luke? No, nothing specific. It was just um, more so if there was any like particular um, examples, like a way a, a company does it. But I think the uh, 14 days as a, as a rough F estimate gives a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah no worries. Um, actually, gen generally, the study study support is actually quite, is actually confidential um, for most companies. Um, but yeah, generally, I'd say the market yeah, is probably 10 to 14 for part threes. I'm not too sure about like part one or part twos. They're, they're generally like if they're part one or part two exams, they'll probably be you know if, if you, um less days compared to part part threes. Um, a few other questions did pop up in the chat. Um, what are some differences in the work between life and general insurance? Which one's more technical? Um, I'd say they're very different industries like um you know and that's why you don't really see too many people move from life insurance to general insurance or general insurance to life insurance skills get you know and programming everything's quite different um i would say you know i have seen yeah like some for example some people move life to gen life in general recently um in terms of which one's more technical i'd say you know um it's it's, it's quite hard to answer because you know it's like comparing apples to oranges but um, I would say the life insurance market it's it's quite mature. Um, you know, it's been it's been around for for you know a long time. Whereas general insurance, there's um, you know, I'd say there's probably a little bit more focus on like for example like data analytics. Um, you know, maybe some more new products as well. Um, I'd say um, you know, that's why I guess yeah, general insurance, you know has been probably a bit more popular recently compared to life insurance but honestly i would say they're both they're both very good industries to be in um as well they're pretty comparable um which other countries can australian actuaries work work in um interesting question um so you know um yeah the actual market is not a um you know it's not exactly the biggest you know, industry in the world um i think worldwide i think there's probably only like a hundred thousand actuaries or so um, so in terms of countries, you know, I'd say the biggest is biggest demand would probably be Asia. Um, so Singapore, you know, a lot of companies have their, um, like APAC, um, you know, headquarters in, in Singapore, you know, um, Hong Kong is quite a big, big area, but also like Europe, like, um, can be quite, quite big as well. Like a lot of, you know, you know a lot of Swiss companies, um you know G german company as well um the, the us us pretty big demand uk as well um i say yeah, there's generally like a lot of mobility in terms of where actuaries can go but i guess it also can be um you know quite hard i would say it's probably not the easiest to transition so for example if you want to roll like for example like some products are, are um, unique to australia as well so you know group for example like group pricing or group group um Group policies in in Australia, you know, it's quite different to you know group policies in like China, for example, as well. So I think um you know got to contextualize yeah you know, what your experience has been or like for example like you know there's there's more products or um, the work you might do might might only be specific to Australia as well. So something important to consider. But um you know there's quite a big demand for for Australian actuaries in terms of like Singapore um and um yeah Asian countries as well. Um, do insurance companies generally have a wealth management department as well, or do they get outsourced from a consultancy firm? Um, how different is wealth management career progression from general or life insurance? I mean, some companies also have like a wealth management department, like Cle like Clearview, um, they do a, like life and wealth. Um, I mean, to be honest, I would say wealth management 
it's not as popular or it's not as big as you know more traditional actual world wars like you know or you know, compared to general insurance life insurance um and to be honest i haven't worked too much in wealth management it, it's, it's quite a niche field so i'm actually not too sure um you know what the answer is unfortunately um but i would say i would say in terms of uh, wealth management is also a bit more non-traditional as well, but um, the career progression would be quite set out, you know, like similar to to general insurance or life insurance as well. Um, what is your biggest advice for uni students who want to pursue a career in actuarial? Um, also, my advice is, you know, um, try if you're still studying, try your best to build up your experience. Um, honestly, graduate roles are very competitive. Um, you know, like massive companies, like some of the ones I mentioned, you know, um, in like life insurance, general insurance, you know, they're massive companies, but they only hire, you know, a few, a few um, graduates every year. So, you know, it's quite, very competitive. And, you know, there's quite a big cohort of, of graduates every year. Everyone graduates at the same time. So the more you can do to distinguish yourself, um, you know, on your CV, the better, you know, opportunity or better chance you have as well whether that be through internships so you know try get you know actual internships if possible but you know also those are quite competitive but if you can't if you can't unfortunately get an actual internship try maybe you know working try get an office job i guess um and then you know or you know if or as as uh, i guess the last resort you know try getting any sort of job if you don't have any anything to put in resume right um or try volunteering you know maybe join like mass or join your you know join other societies at university um yeah that's definitely good things to put in your put in your cv um what's the work culture like at skl um i mean we're, we're quite a small team but like yeah it probably wouldn't be as helpful to you guys because you know we're we don't hire actuaries um um <laughs> So not too sure how helpful that would be, but you know, SKL we're we're a small, yeah, small tight knit team. Um, you know, we've only got you know six six or seven people in the company. Um, as as well. Um, in terms of other questions, yeah, what other career paths can you take with an actual science degree? Um, I kind of touched on this, I think, at the start of the presentation. Um, so, you know, most most actual grads go into like general insurance, life insurance, but you know, you can also pursue other other areas, you know, pretty much anything financial services related. So you can go to like investment banking, um, you know, find risk, risk as well. Um, you can, you know, pretty much go to anything financial um, services related. Um, will companies ask for evidence for foundation program paper exemption from undergrad student? I mean, they potentially could. Um, I don't think it really happens too much, but I mean, yeah, probably wouldn't recommend lying about what exemptions you have. Um, you know, it's good to good to be honest. Um, do companies seek academic oriented actuaries, and would you say it's more less difficult to get into a private company as a PhD, or is it an undergrad applying for grad program? Um, I mean, to be honest, I would say most actuaries don't really have a PhD. Um, you know, it, it can help, but um, I'd say it's not really necessary for for an actuary. Um, I think most would stop probably at masters. Um, I mean, it can. It's quite tricky depending on what role ro what role you you're going in. If you specialize, maybe like data analytics, um, you know, could could help. But um, I would say sometimes, to be honest, sometimes if you do have a PhD, you know. You might want to like it might actually make it more difficult to look for a job as well because generally you command a higher salary the more um you know qualifications you have or generally phds but more experienced so it might it might work in reverse to be honest but um, i'd say it's not too necessary for, for an actuary um but in your opinion after looking at the market and actual not being a really big industry what kind of demand do you think we have would have for graduates um to be honest i would say every single industry is competitive for grads um you know there's always an influx of graduates um you know everyone graduates at the same time like it doesn't matter what industry and to be honest like there's always you know more more graduates then there are job opportunities um 
but yeah, I, I guess actual like actual world, like in terms of actuaries, there's yeah, there's not too too many graduate opportunities. So I would say, and it's quite competitive. I would say if you're finding it hard to get an actual job after graduating, I would recommend just probably yeah, look at something maybe in financial services, and then you can you can always pivot back into actual world in the future as well. You know, you can join maybe like you know go banking, go join like you know, home bank or something, go in the banking industry for you know a year or so, and then you can transition back into actual world as well. Um, or like be be looking for actual jobs in the meantime. Um, do you need PR to work at actual companies? Um, it's not a hard set prerequisite. I mean, to be honest, I would say if you are if you are PR, it probably does put you at an advantage compared to if you're on a visa, just because you know probably after two years, as as um someone that's not a PR citizen, your, your visa is going to expire if you're on the the four or five visa. Um, which means, you know, you need to be sponsored, which is an additional cost to companies. So, you know, I mean, to be honest, I would say that my, I might make it a bit harder, but, uh, you know, it's not a hard to prerequisite. Um, you know, you can still get a job as, as a, as an international student. Um, I think that's, that's all our questions. Um, we've gone a little bit over time, but thanks everyone for, for staying on. And, and thanks a lot to Harry for, for your time and going through that. I think everyone found that the presentation really useful and the answer to the questions um, really helpful. I uh, just shared a slide with some mass activities and things coming up in the next couple of weeks. So check that out um, before you head off. But yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or you know, feel free to reach out if you have any more questions as well. Yeah, thanks again, Harry. And we'll, we'll post a recording of this session um, on our website in case there's any parts you want to revisit. Yeah, okay, awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.